Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today comes from a family of winemakers. He's currently the president of the Long Island Wine Country, and he's the man you want to know at Pomonic Vineyards, Kareem Masood. Kareem was born in the Kingdom of Bahrain in 1972. By the late 1970s, his parents moved the family to Connecticut, where they began a search for a site to plant a vineyard. After graduating from the Wharton School of Business at New Firstly, of Pennsylvania, Kareem had a brief career in New York as a private equity analyst at a private investment firm. He then moved on to work full-time at the family vineyard Pomonic. Pomonic has been recognized with numerous accolades over the years, including Wine Spectator's Critic's Choice Award, New York Wine and Food Classics Winery of the Year Award, and received outstanding reviews in Robert Parker's Wine Advocate. Outside of Pomona, Cream serves on the Riverhead Farmland Preservation Committee, on the executive board of the Long Island Farm Bureau as treasurer, and as I said, he is currently the president of Long Island Wine Country. Welcome, Kareem. Thank you. Um, tell us about uh, the wines you, you brought, and I know we're going to crack at least two of them. You brought a ton of wine. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> uh, but uh, what you know, you can take us through the lineup, what you brought, and then and I I, I went through. I think I'd like the the Petit Verdot, maybe try both Shinnins just as a stand up thing. But uh, what yeah. what do we got? What do we got? All right. So um, by the way, so we we pronounce it Pamanoc. Yeah, uh, it rhymes with Montauk. We believe. We're okay. Not, we're not actually Pamanoc. Yeah. 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 So we're not. I'm actually... from Jersey. It's Pomonic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pomonoc. I will try. I don't think I'll have to say it too much anymore. <laughs> um, we're we're not Native American, my family, but that's the old Native name for Long Island. Yes. And uh, uh, when oh, we when we first okay. came up with the name, um, it was actually my mother who remembered because we we really should be called Masood Family Vineyards. We're absolutely a family affair. Yeah. Pamanaka uh, is owned and operated by, I uh, founded by my parents and my brothers and I uh, run it today with, with my parents still. And um, anyway, my, my mother is the one who re recalled that Walt Whitman had a name for Long Island and she's like, didn't he have this name? And, and she researched it and discovered it was Pamanaka. And anyway, at the time, I was like, "This isn't maybe the best name because it's this weird name." No, you know, people don't know people how to pronounce can't it. Say it, and, and, and I'm not uh, the least educated person. But but of course, not the most. But <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, but <laughs> of course, wine is all about place and provenance. <laughs> I'm so, saying it over my head. I'm going to get it right. <laughs> and so, what better name than the old native name for this place where we grow our grapes? I love that. I love and, how you uh, pay homage to uh, the land, you know, and and respect. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so what wines have we from Pamanok? Yeah. <laughs> so I, what I brought today, I brought a 2014 Chenin Blanc. I thought it would be fun to uh, you know, maybe taste something with a little bit of bottle age mm -hmm. uh, because God knows we, we sell a lot of our wines too young. As my father says, try explaining aging wine to the bank. We don't have the luxury of just <laughs> waiting until the wine you can't, uh, can't do what Vegas Cecilia does, man. Just can't. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, <laughs> we have a couple of wines where we're beginning to get some bottle time before release. But um, I also brought two of our minimalist wines, our minimalist Chardonnay and minimalist Chenin Blanc. And then I brought the um, uh, Petit Verdot, our Apollo Drive Vineyard Petit Verdot, our 2019 Cabernet Franc, and the 2015 Assemblage. Ooh. Well, you know what, man? I I, you should just pour what you think is going. Well, you know, it's going to taste good. Um, so uh, let's get some wine going, because you know, open something. All we're, right, we're, let's get some wine right. going. And so, Kareem, that's a your family. You said it's a family Stop. operation. It's a basketball family, right? <laughs> no, I kid. Um, so we like to start at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, how long did you live in the kingdom of Bahrain? Oh, I I was there for all of six weeks. Oh, okay. So you, you really have but, no... But there is a tie-in with that story and, you know, and wine. So yeah. my father had a whole career at IBM. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he, and he started his career with IBM in the Middle East because that's where he's from. My father was born and raised in, in, in Lebanon. And uh, my mother was born and raised in Germany in the Pfalz. And so she definitely oh. has a, a wine. Yeah. Um, she still has relatives to this day who are vintners in the Pfalz. And so they met in the obvious place in Philadelphia. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they, they fell in love, got married, and my father started his career with IBM. They offered him an opportunity in the Middle East, and so it was briefly in Bahrain, but then we moved to Kuwait. 
And Kuwait, of course, is a dry country, literally and figuratively. It's it's a desert and yeah. it's a Muslim country. You can't legally uh, buy alcohol. Oh, that's right. It's, it's dry squared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is my father had to make wine out of necessity, as he put it, in order to have alcohol. So it was his first time uh, making wine as as a home, uh, you know, as a home winemaker. His first time he made wine, period, is his first exposure to making wine. And around the same time, my parents did spend time with my mother's family in in the Fels, and and my father's like, you know, these people, meaning the vintners, he's like, these people seem happy. Right. Like, like you can make a living doing this. Like, <laughs> and but he meanwhile he had he was still like you know very much a career guy at IBM. He wasn't ready to walk away from IBM. He gets transferred to New York, and uh, you know, uh, and then I guess I'll come back to that because it's uh, it's a bit of a long story. But uh, well, I mean, to, to your father's credit, first of all, I mean, like IBM in the seventies, that was gold. Like you got a job at IBM, you you like had a career path. Exactly. You, I mean, you were gonna make money. You're gonna be. You're gonna. Be, your family's gonna be fine. You know, um, my dad worked at the post office. I don't know why I know about <laughs> IBM, but, uh, um, but no, I know I, I, you know, I, I'm into all that shit. <clears throat> uh, amazing company. IBM was an amazing company, particularly back then with systems. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. So, when was it? Uh, and also, this is this is just incredible. Like you, you, you have ties to the falls, um, and I'll get into that later because I could go down a whole other rabbit hole with that right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you have any significant memories of your time in the Middle East, though? Because it's a part of the um, world most people in America yeah. particularly know nothing about. You know? So, so that was very early childhood for me. I mean, we left Kuwait when I was like five. But okay. I mean, to answer your question, I mean, I do have a couple memories, and the, you know, it was very cool. Um, my father would go uh, swimming in the Persian Gulf, and mm. he he would go spear fishing, mm -hmm. like uh, very cool. And we, I remember going on a sailboat with my parents to this island off the, you know, off the shore. And it was like, you know, uh, this small, literally on, not on the map island where we camped overnight, that type of thing. And um, a couple other memories of the, the apartment in Kuwait and like learning to swim there. And uh, uh, I remember like the, um, the pita bread that they would bake like a, oh. in a, in a out, like wood fired oven, like on a big stone and it was like fresh out of them with the big bubbles in the bread. And, you know, and as a three or four year old, like that was like it was amazing. Damn, that's that'd be amazing as a fifty three year old. I mean, <laughs> that sounds great. Um, your dad sounds like an interesting guy. Spear fishing. I mean, that's like making his own he, line. He is like he a is, Renaissance yeah. man. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, how old were you when you when you you mentioned that you moved to New York? And did you live in New York, or did, and we know you grew up in there was some Connecticut thing going on? So. Yeah, we, we have we have relatives in New Jersey, and so there was a brief like. A few months that we were in New Jersey before my parents settled in Stamford, Connecticut, where I grew up with my brothers. Okay. And uh, no sooner had they settled in Connecticut than my father is reading the New York Times. This is Frank Pryle at the time, writing about the Hargraves, who were the pioneers on Long Island. They planted their first vines in 1973. And so five years later, my parents are reading about them in the Times. And my father looks at my mother, and he's like, you know, we might be able to do this in our own backyard. Because they had already started sort of dreaming about, like, maybe one day we'll become vintners. And and so they're like, let's drive out there and meet these people. And so they did. They, my, my, my one brother at the time, um, uh, my third brother who hadn't been born, I mean, my, my second brother hadn't been born yet. And we drove out. And um, uh, and so my parents sort of, uh, as my father puts it, they became... Uh, inebriated with the idea of becoming vintners themselves one day, yeah. and uh, they be and so over the next few years they began looking at properties out there. Since we had the connection in New Jersey, and since we lived in Connecticut, we actually looked in the tri-state area. But my parents concluded that the North Fork of Long Island is where it's at if you're going to look f near the New York metro area. Yeah. And uh, long story short, they finally closed on our home property in 1983, and they planted our first vines that same season. When when it was still affordable to buy land for most yeah, people, yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> like right, that's like there right. was there was no Hamptons thing back. I mean it was you know it was, wasn't a big, there was, but it hadn't quite. Yeah, yeah it wasn't. Yeah. You know it wasn't. That's right. You know it wasn't yeah, the that's true. thing. You know absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so um, your your teenage years, those were in Stanford, Connecticut, right? Yeah. All right. So then, uh, where'd you go to university? University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so you went there for. 
undergrad and then went okay yeah yeah i i went there for undergrad i I got a degree in economics from the wharton school at penn and then uh, i had a brief career here in in the city in new york in finance for two years and long story short i decided to get out of it and i had we can do some long stories man we got got plenty of time to talk okay yeah yeah. um no philadelphia so it was that was that because your your parents met there or just i mean is that right yeah so yeah, I mean the the my father got his MBA at Wharton. Oh, okay, and so that was definitely uh, very key. I mean, they definitely look favorably on right. you know, having the next generation go to, come to your school, and so he went there for his MBA. I went for my undergrad, um, but Penn was was great. I had a great experience there. What was your cheesesteak place? Billy Bob's. Your Billy Bob's. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I went to. Uh, Rutgers Camden for okay. graduate school. Okay. But I spent a ton of time in Philly. I had okay. girlfriends who okay. went to yeah. Penn. Yeah. I used to get the chicken cheesesteak from Billy Bob's. Yes, yes. Yeah, that I was, that was I like <laughs> <laughs> the chicken cheesesteak at Billy Bob's is great. Yeah. 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 Oh my god. Yeah. West Philadelphia, yeah. born yeah. and raised. Yeah. yeah. Um that's super cool. So then you came back to the city and you you, were, you worked briefly in finance. Um what was were were you yearning to go back out to long island or just you just are you, yeah you know? yeah very good question so i mean in, in my case like um i had been already very involved of course uh maybe it's not obvious i should say so but i mean like when my parents started i mean we were my, my brothers and i were were with them oh right so e- you even you probably planted like yeah tell us i mean about i was it. 10 years old when my parents okay. planted the first vines but i was literally literally in the vineyard in my father's footsteps uh, I mean, you know, there's only so much work you're doing as a 10 year old, but you get the point. I mean, over the years, especially in my house, we was doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Help my dad build a pool when we were 10 years old, having to hold chalk lines. And <laughs> <laughs> I kid. <laughs> so, um, we, you know, in the 80s, it was actually kind of like, I mean, you're going to say, oh, tough life, you know, but I mean, it was kind of rough. Like, we had to mow the lawn at home in Connecticut and then come out to Long Island, mow the lawn again and work in the vineyard. Yeah. And uh, so we did, uh, you know, uh, we definitely had our chores cut out for us as as kids. Uh, But, uh, and in the 80s, like, we didn't know that many people out out, out in Long Island Uh and uh, and the friends we had were back home. And and so there was definitely the sense of, like, do we have to go out there and, like, you know, um, on one hand, on the other hand, there was always this this awareness that something special was happening, and uh, so as I went to school and like got into the real world, so to speak, I always had in the back of my mind that this was something I could fall back on. And in fact, I was so excited about what my parents were doing when I was a junior at Penn. Uh, I approached them and I told them, like, look, you know, I think I want to work for you mm. when I graduate. And they were like, well. That's- it's not why we're sending you <laughs> to work. <Wharton. Exactly. laughs> For them, in their mind, it was still very much a, a gamble, um, and uh, they basically politely told me to get a real job. And I was like, "All right, I guess the door is closed." And so, uh, so I did that, and um, and you know, I, I enjoyed my brief career doing what I was doing in the world of private equity. Um, mm-hmm. It was interesting. It was fun, but I, I. Uh, I, part of the reason I knew I could, um, I mean, I, I, at the time I actually had different thoughts about what I might, might do, and I was 25 years old, um, and uh, I thought about the Peace Corps. I thought about, I actually did do a little bit of traveling, and um, and I, th- I mentioned film. I thought about getting, I actually worked on a, on a short film uh, at the time uh, in a very minor co- way, but I was like, you know, I was like, I can do something totally different. Right. And, um, and and so I walked away from what was a career position, but very quickly I was back home, mm-hmm. and my parents were like, you know, if you're home, you're gonna work, <laughs> and I'm like, well, of course, yeah. I'm like, put me to work. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here to work. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so what turned out, what, what started as a somewhat temporary thing, has now been, uh, uh, what's it been, almost 24 years that I'm there full time. So, Chin and Blanc is very tasty, by the way. Um, wasn't we love Shannon? Yeah, I love Shannon too. Um, uh, it's actually very tasty. I mean, you know, Long Island wines have come a long way. I'm sure we'll get into that later. But let's go back to <clears throat> um, you, you break ground. How many acres are there at 
Pamonok. 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 How many how many acres do you have under uh, Vine? Uh, so presently we're around eighty five acres, and when I say I say it like that because we've had we've gone through an, a very un, like difficult period where we've had to rip out some vineyards due mm-hmm. to leaf roll virus. Mm-hmm. So we've been planting some new vineyards, ripping up old ones. So right now we're around eighty five acres okay. uh, planted. Um, and we have some more room to, to grow at Pamanak. We also own and operate Palmer Vineyards. Oh, I remember Palmer, um, Palmer yeah, yeah. Where it, which has 49 acres of vineyards planted. So it's it's a lot of work. Um, but the Chenin Blanc, uh, this is one of these great stories in wine. It's not like, but by the way, let me rewind to the little my father. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, they, I told you already about my parents a bit, but my, my, my father is very much a Francophile. He grew up speaking French. He studied in Paris, and so it, and his love for wine was very much French. Right. You know, his reference points were very much Bordeaux mm-hmm. and Burgundy, mm-hmm. and then of course, the Riesling from from the Feltz. So we right. couldn't we couldn't do what we do without growing Riesling, and we do grow Riesling. I didn't bring any today, but we're very proud of our Riesling as well. But the point is, um, Shannon was not on his. It was not part of the the master plan. Right. <laughs> and uh, my parents ended up acquiring the vineyard across the street in the mid 80s and uh, the folks who planted that vineyard had planted a bunch of different varieties most of which my parents had no confidence in and they were ripping them out including the Chenin Blanc and so we had a German uh, with through my mother's you know connections we had a German uh, um, uh, young man at the time uh, who was was looking after the vineyard in my parents absence because we weren't out there full time yet and so he told my father he's like Charles the Chenin looks happy and healthy like why are you ripping out the vines He's like, you know, maybe Uva's right. Maybe, uh, but really it had to do with the fact he was running out of time. He's like, you know, I'm running out of time. Maybe Uva's right. I'm just going to leave a couple. <laughs> I'm going to leave a couple acres of Chenin Blanc. Yeah. And it's turned into one of our most successful wines. Nice. Uh, we're, we're very happy with it. it. It can be it can be challenging to grow. It's, it's very rot susceptible. It's very similar to Sauvignon Blanc, but Sauvignon ripens earlier. This ripens, uh, Chenin ripens later. But, um, you know, we've been doing it long enough that... Uh, uh, we feel like we've been, r- we got lucky. You yeah, know? yeah, really cool. So, <clears throat> how do you? How does one start a vineyard from scratch? I mean, like, like you buy the land. There was no vines planted. Correct uh, on this particular property. It's a potato farm, and that's the same. The same is true for most vineyards on Long Island. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At one point, the Eastern Long Island agriculture was dominated by potatoes, yep. cabbage, ducks. Uh, all of which are still there, but in much uh, smaller um, uh, acreage than it used to be. Just enough for the farmer's market on Route 27 <laughs> when you come into the Hamptons for the summer. Um, yeah, so, like, did you guys have a consulting enologist? Can, I mean, like, like, did, like is, do you plant vines by hand? Is there a backhoe? Yeah. Like, yeah. like, how, how yeah. does this happen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a little. I mean, uh, my, my parents did have various like help and consultants over the years, but the one of the first was my my mother's uncle, okay, Uncle Werner, uh, who was a a, a vintner uh, himself, a grower, a grape grower in in the Feltz, and uh, he came over in 1983 when my parents had just bought the farm, and he's like, look, Charles, he's like, go to John Deere and ask them for the narrowest tractor that they have, mm. and so because <laughs> he's like, oh, he's like, what's with all these giant Tractors, <laughs> right. you know, and, uh, and for, so, good for potatoes, yeah, not good for yeah, barn. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, uh, and my father listened to him. And at the time, we were the first vineyard to plant as densely as we did, which mm-hmm. today isn't that dense. It was like eight by four, like eight feet mm-hmm. between rows and four feet between vines. But at the time, it was the most densely planted on Long Island. And you know, they did, uh, but they got soils, did soil samples, and. Uh, had different uh, consultants who, who were involved at uh, different stages. Um, there was a, a great symposium in 1988 uh, where a professor from the University of Bordeaux came over and sort of like, you know, the industry, our, the, our, our industry hosted his, his visit. And my parents were present, uh, which is really an amazing story in, in the following way. Um, so this was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Professor Seguin who they at the time they dug a doil, a soil pit on Long Island and you know here you have an expert from Bordeaux right uh, he, he's a professor at the University of Bordeaux he goes down there and they're waiting you know he's examining the soil profile and whatnot and he takes some time and they're all 
sort of scratching their head like what's what's he gonna say when he comes up and he comes up and he's like he's like this reminds me of Grav mm. and my father's like that's cool great <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's better yeah uh, you know he, he could have said something uh, less, less positive <laughs> Poughkeepsie <laughs> wah 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 <laughs> right. uh, but you know that's an existential part of of you know our region, like we, we would not exist as a region if our soils did not drain as well as they do. Mm. Because as as pe- anyone who knows Long Island, you know that Long Island is flat. Yep. And if you know mm-hmm. wine, you know that most of the most favored sites in the world are on slopes. Yep. And so how does that jive with fine wine? And so the, the explanation is our soil is truly, um, I can actually use adjectives like extremely well it, and it, without being hyperbolic they do the there it's a sandy loam okay. with sandy gravelly subsoil so when we have a rain event which which we sometimes do uh, i mean there's definitely a, a good amount of rain on long island some years more than others but if we have a significant rain event you rarely see any pondling or ponding or puddling it'll just drain it's like a giant sieve it just drains right through and um but what a story i was going to tell you is like that was in 88 that symposium i mentioned fast forward to 20 15 and 16, uh, the protege of Professor Seguin was is Case Van Leeuwen. I don't know if you know the name. He 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 was a, 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 a the head viticulturist at Chateau Cheval Blanc. Okay. And then he himself became a professor at the University of Bordeaux. Anyway, he did a similar sort of uh, um, uh, uh, get together and soil pit on Long Island uh, with my brother and I and and others. But I, I had the unique experience where six months later I was in Bordeaux with him. I was attending a seminar on terroir at the uh, University of Bordeaux, and, and so the same guy, uh, now in Bordeaux in the Omé d'Arc, uh, dug, dug a couple different soil pits. So it was really uh, illuminating to 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 do that with someone like him. And um, um, I forgot where I was going with that, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned that. Um, your your fr- your folks had done a soil analysis. Mm-hmm. Where does one do a soil analysis on the East Coast? Like in California, I know you go to yeah. you go to Davis, or you go to Fresno yeah. State. Yeah. Where where does one get their soil analyzed over here in this in this area? Well, well, the actual soil analysis might happen at different labs that aren't affiliated with the university. But to, I know where you're going with that yeah. question, and that would be Cornell. Okay. Right. Corn- okay. Cornell University is I, I can't uh, overstate how important and helpful and 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 key they are a key partner. Uh, in, in, and there's this this uh, term uh, applied research. Mm-hmm. You, you hear about that as a student, and you're like, "What does that mean?" Like, well, it's, well, it ties in with industry and so forth. But they really do excellent applied research, where uh, meaningful research that translates into what we do on a day to day basis in in our in our vineyard in particular, uh, but also in the winemaking. I mean, they now have a four year uh, enology and viticulture program at Cornell University, and so at, at Cornell. I, I believe, like uh, other, some of these other universities, they have an extension program, mm-hmm. and so there's Cornell Cooperative Extension in, in Riverhead, where which is you know in Got Eastern it. Long Island right. where we are, right. and and they're uh, been incredibly helpful. Really cool, really cool. So, <clears throat> you guys plant break ground in '83, was it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, the first vineyard. Yeah, first, first vineyard. We didn't actually eight. start making wine as in, in the state winery until 1990. So okay. we, we were growers for the '80s. So, um, were you, you guys sold the grapes? Mm-hmm. Okay, exactly. What what spurred my parents into actually, you know, um, um, making the big jump to 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 build a winery was 1988. '88 was a great vintage on Long Island, and my parents were selling uh, their fruit to to the folks who would ultimately become their, you know. Friendly competitors are because uh, you know the, we're we're very very tight uh, as a wine industry, mm-hmm. as I like to say we're we're tight geographically, but we're also tight you know socially. Um, anyway, the point is they were selling their crop to to our neighbors, and they're like, oh my god, this is beautiful because we, we got to start making our own wine. And so we actually made a wine in 1989, our very first Pomanoc label, which was produced at Bridgehampton Winery, which no longer exists. Uh, but anyway, by 1990, they had something to sell, and 1990 was our first vintage as an estate winery where everything was made, you know, at, at Pomanoc, at the winery. Mm. So what were you, uh, what was your number one seller when you guys were just growers? What was your biggest, what was your cash crop? Uh, I th- at the time, I think it would have been Chardonnay. Okay. Uh, Cabernet and Merlot. Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Franc at the time was not. 
as big as it is today on Long Island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, <clears throat> um, and that first wine that you guys did in house, that was a Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm going to assume, or was that a Chardonnay? Uh, so in 1990, we had, oh, the very first one was so a for, Chardonnay. So Chardonnay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Barrel fermented Chardonnay, okay. Burgundian style. Yeah. Okay. And then the one that you actually had some to sell, what was that? That was, I mean, that was the that was wine, the, the, the eight, 1989 yeah. barrel fermented Chardonnay, and okay. then in, in 1990 we made four wines okay. at, at Palmanac, two whites and two reds, a dry Riesling and a barrel fermented Chardonnay, and a Merlot and a Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so you're back on the farm, the family farm. Um, kind of like, what was your, uh, what was like your role? So when I first came back, that was in 90, when I came back full time, yeah. oh, that was another thing I wanted to mention earlier, Please. like when, like, uh, how did I exit my, 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 my career in finance? Um, what I did at that time when I worked five days a week, Monday through Friday in New York, mm -hmm. I often did Saturday, Sunday at the winery, like working, working in the tasting room. And I, I worked seven days a week. And, you know, I, I was 23, 24, like a young man, I did no problem working seven days a week, right? And, but the point is, like, when I finally left one career to begin another, uh, I really truly mean it when I say it. I mean, I, I, I feel like I retired, like, 30 years early. And, 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 and I have the, 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 the good fortune and the privilege to be able to say that I love what I do. I mean, I, it, you, and if you, uh, you're not actually working, you're just doing what you love to do. I mean, yep. it, it can be a labor of love, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but so I, I've, I've, and and there are all kinds of sort of uh, personal growth uh, situations where I feel I really feel like I've sort of like self actualized where like I'm like one day I'm going to be the one I want to be the winemaker. I'm like in order to get from point A to point B, I need to learn this, that, and the other thing. And uh, but it was very much an, an organic, natural sort of like path for me to 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 go that way and say this is what I'm going to do. Okay. But how'd you actually quit? You, did you do like a whole Jerry Maguire said, I'm not going to do whatever. Like, no, I'm just kidding. I can't, you don't have to answer. I'm being stupid. <laughs> or you say, screw you guys. I'm out of here. I'm going to make wine. Um, you know, we just had a guest on recently and had, he made a big point about like what you said that uh, most people hate what they do. Most people dread Monday, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. like, you know, if you can find a way to live your life sustainably, it's not about the money. Like, are you yeah. happy? Because we spend so much of yeah. our time working, right? Yeah. And so you're, I mean, I, I heard when you answer that, like there's a, a amount of gratitude you feel great, uh, fortunate. Absolutely. To be able to do that. Absolutely. Very grateful. And uh, my, my father, when I first started, my father, I would overhear him speaking to people. And it sounded like a little bit corny to me when he said, like, he's like, you know, we live in paradise. I'm like, that's like, you know, that's, that's a pretty, yeah, like. stretched out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like. And, and he would also say things like, you know, it's it's not about the money, it's about the lifestyle. Yeah. But both of those things are basically true because paradise, after all, is a, a relative thing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, the grass is always greener somewhere else until you realize that no, it's not. It's it's about it's in your head, mm -hmm. and and so when you get that awareness and and uh, and you don't get caught up in a rat race and and money and whatnot, you're like, wait a second, this is what we've got going here is pretty cool. It's pretty good. Um, the big uh, curveball here is Mother Nature. Yeah. And sorry, my father just has so many good lines, I have to repeat them. But, Please. But the best one of all, really, is winemaking is less of an art and more of a partnership with Mother Nature. Unfortunately, she's the senior partner. Ooh. <laughs> that's a good one. I don't know that I've heard that one. That's a really it's good true. one. It, it is true. true. It's no, totally I like true. that. Yeah. It's, it's spot yeah. on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you had mentioned earlier, like, like, at some point, they signed off on you coming back and working full time because originally, like, get, get your ass a job, you're going to work. Yeah, you know? yeah. But uh, well, yeah, when I came back, when I left, I mean, the, the, it was very much like, like, look, if you're going to be here, you have to work. Okay. I'm like, well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not right. going to sit here and not do anything. I'm like, I'll, I'll work. And you know, if I mean, at the beginning, my father, I think, was deliberately paying me like next to nothing. What, what were some uh, of the jobs but, he had uh, you doing? But, uh, like, like, what, like, did you do everything? Like, you know, like, oh, I, I hose down the winery. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I definitely cellar rat all and, that. And shit. that's that's the way you should learn. Yeah. You, you you should not just be promoted because you have the right last name. I mean, you need to know. 
And so, um, I mean, I was packing boxes on the bottling line. I mean, you name it, taking out the garbage, cleaning up the garbage, <laughs> uh, serving people in the tasting room, running cases back and forth from the warehouse. Um, uh, but like in the cellar, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't making executive decisions. I was, I was a cellar hand. I was washing tanks, washing hoses and the press, I mean, uh, emptying the pumice, uh, driving the pre- tractor out in the field to empty the pumice. And, um, all things that, you know, are, these are it's all standard practice at any winery around the world. Um, and, and it was a great experience. Like, you, you, you absolutely should go through those steps if you want to be um, a winemaker who understands. You know, it's, it's amazing how much we have in common with the restaurant world. Mm. You have these chefs, uh, m- many of the big-name chefs. Uh, many of them did go to CIA or Cordon Bleu or whatever it is, but many of them started as dishwashers. Yep. And they work their way, way up, and they prove themselves, and, and it's very much hands-on uh, um, learning. And 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 in that sense, the wine making trade is very very similar. Yeah, you know, Anthony Bourdain famously said one time, like, give me give me a Mexican over a CIA chef any day, like who yeah. started yeah. in the kitchen yeah. Yeah. and has seen everything, has washed the dishes, where it learns how to handle a knife. Exactly. Um, there's such value in that. Um, for there's probably a lot of people who listen to this who who've never been to a winery. Even I'd have to think. I don't know. I don't know who listens to this. <laughs> Does anybody listen to this? <laughs> um, what? Like, um, so you said like the the part about you know uh, Mother Nature being the senior partner. Yeah. Um, talk about um, because you know there's this whole thing with natural wine now. Yeah. And, and they don't. They're not cleaning the. Pump. It's just. It's just riding dirty. Yeah. Like. What do you think? It's like, a great way of describing it. Yeah. Um, your part of that is like, why is it important to make sure everything's clean? Like, like why? Why, well, why is that? First of all, I'm half, I'm half German. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So, Precision. And my father, the ultimate wine making machine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, that's. A, I mean, we know German wine. German, yeah. German wine is is awesome yeah. uh, and clean yeah. for the most part. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there are exceptions there too. Uh, and my father, who's obvious, is Lebanese, uh, is definitely of the technically correct school of winemaking. Uh, I, you know, natural wine. Um, look, I mean, our, our minimalist wines are sort of share a similar raison d'être, like very hands off. Yeah, yeah there's like, a difference between and let just let it be, yeah, yeah. And whatever it wants to be, let it be a, a vin de terroir. That that is the aspiration of those wines to to have it be a vin de terroir. To vin de terroir. I don't inoculate. I don't do anything at all. I just uh, the only, only thing I might add would be a touch of sulfites. Okay. And a touch means like thirty or forty parts per million. It's really next to nothing. And um, so, th- but that's sort of where it ends. I, I want my wines to be clean, fresh, to have character. Uh, I don't want. I mean, dirty. Uh, there are some wines I've had that I could describe as dirty wines that are delicious, but a lot of them are. They're too f- funky. They're too messed up. They're not good wine. They're bad wine, in my opinion. I, I'll say it. Right. Uh, but but look, I mean, who am I to say that? I mean, every, right. everyone has their own taste, right? I mean, b- there are people who genuinely seem to <laughs> like those wines. <laughs> no, apparently, um, so, uh, I, I agree with but, you. <laughs> I don't get it. We had we had uh, Bobby Stuckey was on last week. We haven't mm-hmm. dropped the episode. But he, like a couple years ago, Jordan Salcedo interviewed him in the article. And he's like, you know, as a psalm. First of all, is the wine flawed? And yeah. a lot of those wines are flawed, yeah. right? So, like, I mean, based on the classical uh, understanding of what fine wine right, is, right. or generally accepted, you know. Right. But that's the beauty of this. Is and that's why I tell people when I do tours and so forth. Like, you know, we can talk about art, we can talk about cin- like fine art, cinema, music, whatever, and have completely wildly Absolutely. different different interpretations of what's good and bad. And it's it's the same in wine. Yeah. Yeah. Well. A stick figure is a stick figure. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Might be art when you're five <laughs> on, on, on your mom's refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, a good, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, my God. So um, <clears throat> how um, how does – let's talk about the growth. So mm-hmm. your first, you know, 89, make wine, 90. Uh, about how many cases or how, you know, how many bottles do you produce in like in, in, in 1990 um, know, overall? So, you know, 1990, I was in school. I was at Pat, but my father was okay. producing about, um, I'm going to say, around two to 3,000 cases a year. Okay. 
uh, I mean, back in 90, and maybe it was, um, it might have been more like one to 2,000, but I think he pretty quickly got up to two to three, and then four to five. I mean, today we're in this sort of 10 to 12,000 in the case range at Pamanak, mm -hmm. and then at Palmer we're doing like five, six, uh, even seven or 8,000, depending on, on the size of the crop and whether we're, uh, at Palmer we do sometimes sell some of the fruit, so it depends whether we're doing that. Um, but all so altogether between the two wineries now we're doing you know we're in the neighborhood of like anywhere from twelve to eighteen uh, depending on the year. So, <clears throat> as you guys become um, wine uh, producers instead of wine growers, um, you said you did a cab, a merlot, a riesling, and a chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, what did you roll out next? Like, what was the rollout? Yeah, good question. What was the the fifth one? Um, probably the semi dry riesling. Okay. Because as my father likes to say, I'm sorry, I have to, but but, but, but he, he does, well, like, dad, he's got well, all I'm the. Not, he's, come on, man! <laughs> give dad his props. Absolutely. <laughs> and by the way, my my middle name is Charles, which is my father's name, Charles Masood. Uh, he observed that Americans talk dry and they drink sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and so today, I mean, and since then. Um, our semi-dry riesling out we we I mean it outsells the dry riesling three to one I mean we we produce it uh, uh, or even four to one um, we make about twelve hundred cases of the semi-dry and three hundred of the of the dry riesling oh shit and so I believe that was next and around that time uh, nineteen ninety two uh, it was sort of a poor year globally that was the year after Mount Pinatuba blew up and the the when Pinatuba blew up in the Philippines it put up all this. Uh, particulate matter in the stratosphere and created like this this period of global cooling and so point is in 92 we had sort of a cool wet vintage and 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 the whites were filling up with botrytis my mother my mother was all upset in tears my father's like what's wrong he's like you know your the vineyard the fruit's rotting you're like you know what are we gonna do and he said all right let's just sleep on it we'll walk out in the vineyard tomorrow they walk at the vineyard and my mother's like i don't smell any edelfoil uh um i don't smell any vinegar and my father's like, okay, <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> and she's like, this is Edelfoila. My father's like, Edel what? You know, this is this is the noble rot. Yeah. And so again, it was, was not part of the game plan, but my father started making out of necessity because he's like, what am I going to do with this? It's full of botrytis. So he made late harvest wines. We made a late harvest Riesling, a late harvest Sauvignon Blanc, and in '93 we made a late harvest Chenin. It was the only, the one and only late harvest Chenin. I still want to. I've been wanting to do it again. Uh, but it's just so tricky with the late harvest. Um, but we have done late harvest Riesling and late harvest Sauvignon Blanc numerous times. In fact, our late harvest Sauvignon Blanc was was served at the White House uh, twice in two separate decades. Um, and um, and so that those were also some of the the new additions at the time. Some of the first wines we yeah. made were, and th and that was not part of the game plan. Yeah. And then '93 happened. '93 was a great vintage, hot and dry. To 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 a degree where my father was like, I can't put the same label on this wine. Like, especially the reds, they were truly like, you know, more comp, you could see it at, at the crusher, just beautiful color, deep purple and like beautiful wines. And so he came up with the term grand vintage. Uh, he didn't like reserve or, or uh, at, at one winery reserve was like their entry wine, at another winery it was like their their best wine. Private select is yeah. like the six dollar right. bottle. <laughs> like like it's, so, they do it reverse, like you know, a lot of places. <laughs> so he came up with the term grand vintage, which is is cool. It it's a, it, 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 me, it means what it says. It, it was a great vintage. I mean, it was our it's essentially our way of declaring the vintage. We yeah. say so on the label. And we don't do it every year. We only do it in, in what we think was really an exceptional vintage. Well, you know what they say, Kareem? When life gives you botrytis, make late harvest wines. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's really cool. Um, have you got any at Shannon in the library at the, at the, at the, the winery? The, that the, late harvest? The Shannon? late harvest? That, uh, or was it all gone? I, to be honest with you, I would have to hunt for it. I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure myself. We may still have... A couple of bottles. I'm gonna hit you up by email. I'm like, yeah, I'm coming out. Yeah. I'm coming out. Please do. Pull out. Please do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, I like how what I'm one one thing I'm definitely getting is how this is it's been organic how it's grown, and you guys really stayed true to like terroir sense of place. Like you know what could have been a disaster for other people. You're like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Um, 
I and I just when you said like your mom's it's in German, I just think that's so cool. Like yeah. be, because of that, I mean, just when you think about like how fortunate is that your mother comes from that background where like she didn't panic. Like you know, I mean, yeah, do you know that? Yeah, yeah, that's, kind yeah, exactly. I mean, and she did have that experience where she spent time with her her that side of the family who who are vintners who still are some of whom still are. All right, so we get through our um, we get through our late harvest uh, phase, not really phase, but um, mm -hmm. and then um, you know Cabernet and Merlot, particularly Cabernet, Judgment of Paris. Everybody's planting Cabernet. Everybody's planting Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Now we have on the table um, we have a we have a Petit Verdot. We have a Cabernet Franc. Um, when did you guys decide to go in the Petit Verdot Cabernet Franc uh, business? So uh, the Cabernet Franc, the first vineyard was actually planted uh, relatively early, like in the 80s. I believe it was 86 that the Cab Franc went in. That vineyard sadly no longer exists. We just ripped it out a couple of years ago because of leaf roll virus. But um, uh, the first year we produced a varietal, uh, you know, Cabernet Franc label was 98. That was the first vintage. Mm -hmm. And then the Petit Verdot was not even planted until 01. And we made it as a varietal wine for the first time in 05. Now, were these originally planted to blend into like a Bordelais blend? Was yes, that the, exactly. The, the that that, that was the initially. thinking, precisely. Right. And uh, so my father came up. Again, I, 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 like I said, he speaks fluent French. So assemblage, of course, is the French word for blend. And uh, he, heard, he heard French winemakers using that term. He's like, I'm going to use that for my, my proprietary blend, the assemblage. And uh, the first year he did that was in 93. And that, so that's our grand vintage quality uh, blend. We only do it in a grand vintage year. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a quick break right here. And we'll be back and with more of Kareem. And how do you say it? Masood. Pamanak. There you go. <laughs> Pamanak of Pamanak Vineyards on Long Island. We'll be right back, everybody. Okay, man, we got six bottles. Crack something else, man. What are we, what are we tasting here? All right. Want to try that other Shannon? Yeah, let's All do right, that. Let's That's do that. the 2014. You know, 2014. My producer is having a dry march. I don't, told her I don't know why. She She's missing some good wines. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> we, we, had a, we, had a, we had a Maison Loire Bourgogne in here. She got none of it oh by her choice. <laughs> um, but, you know, but, and I don't think, has anyone brought a Shannon? If they have, you weren't here. Wow, this is. So I, I you know, deliberately brought a wine that's a little bit. It's not yeah. even that old. It's a fourteen, but I mean, um, that's eight years old. For most, yeah. most people in America don't drink eight year old white wine. Right. Let's be True. honest. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I like know. most, like yeah. wine True. people do. True. But you True. know, yeah, totally. The, we know that it's. Uh, and I, but I, but I wanted you to taste it because for a couple of reasons. For one thing, you know, it's it's Long Island white wine. Yep. Not, not. I think most people wouldn't have it in their head that like, oh, Lock Long Island white wine, uh, it's a thing. And not only is it like a world class wine, but can it age like world class wine? Right. And the answer is yes, it can. And and I think this wine's beautiful. I think it's uh, possibly better than ever. I mean, 2014 was a, a very special vintage for me. It was the year I got married. Oh. Uh, my wife Karen and I got married in 2014. Get married at the vineyard. And um, we did. And uh, as well as my uh, my, my brother uh, and his wife uh, had their wedding celebration in 2014 as as well. My brother Nabil and his wife Lisa. Uh, but so this is the 2014 Shannon. It was wow. Bottled, yeah, it, I mean the color. It's still like yellow green. Um, it's it's it could be a little cooler, but it's fine because um, it, it's just showing how good it is. Like it's just. They still got acid. Oh yeah, you mean the temperature? Temperature, yeah, yeah. yeah. It could be like a. Well, we I, we thing. often describe this wine as Venice lemonade. Mm. It shares similar qualities as, as with lemonade. It's it's thirst quenching, refreshing. It's got a strong citrus character. Yeah, it really does. And sen <clears throat> sensational when chilled. Yeah. And so in the summer, you put this on an, in an ice bucket. We have fresh local oysters at the winery that come from waters just a few minutes away. 
Are you salivating? Yeah, she, yeah, I'm like, dude, I'm it's, it's on. You got a guest house out there? We're coming to we, we, as a matter of fact, we just finished work on it. <laughs> it's like, I should play the lottery. I, was just, I, did, I had no idea yet to get it, but like, dude, that is like, um, yeah, that that's a match made in heaven. I can see some, some fresh Long Island oysters. Oh, it's, uh, you know, mm. another thing my father says is we produce island wines. Mm. And so when you hear that, it's evocative of seafood, right? Yeah. And so it, it's Long Island. We're so f- fortunate to get all of the seafood landed on our shores, uh, our shores, and so many of our wines do marry well with with that seafood. They're they're eleven, twelve. This is eleven percent. Wow. Some of our wines are twelve, twelve and a half, yeah. thirteen for the whites. But but like this Shannon is eleven percent. I mean, it's really easy to drink. Um, you can have half a bottle. It's a total. And have uh, clams, oysters, uh, striped bass. I mean, all all Ooh. these wonderful Keep things. Keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> It's a porch pounder for sure. You just, mm-hmm. um, yeah. this is so crushable. At eight years old. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, my mind's blown. An eight year old white wine <laughs> from Long Island. Yeah. Wait, an eight year old, not only white, a Chin and Blanc? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are we, are we in the Loire Valley? When it has a little bottle age, it begins to lean that way. When it's really young, I didn't bring the current vintage. The 21, I describe it more as a, as a New World style. Mm hmm. Because it's so young, it's infanticide. But it's it's but we do it because it's it's realizing the adjectives we're looking for: zippy, vivacious, fresh, crisp, and it has this you know sensational character when you chill it. Um, but it's definitely too young. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. All right, what were we talking about? I got caught up in this Shannon Blanc. Okay, uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> what was it like? when your family first bought the vineyard to now what have you what like let's talk about the long island wine country and how like you said i think you said it was it was potato farms and yeah. cabbage patches mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh i mean the the landscape has certainly changed i mean i i can remember driving out on the lie and you go into riverhead and and uh uh, it was still mostly farms. Now you'd get off the LIE. The LIE is the Long Island Expressway for anyone who doesn't know. And, uh, and now it's, it's you know, uh, an outlet center and, and one strip mall after the other and car dealers and whatever. It's just it's almost virtually un- unrecognizable from what it was uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And, and, and that applies to a lot of um, eastern Long Island on one hand. On the other hand, there's something really remarkable has happened, and that's that farmland has been preserved. Yeah, um, I think the number is ten or fifteen thousand acres that have been that are in a farmland preservation program. And Suffolk County was actually the first in the nation to implement such a system. And just briefly, the way it works, you, the farmer sells the right to develop like a, a house on the property, and and return is compensated. They're paid. Uh, to give up that right, but they still own the farmland. So the the logic is, if you're a farmer and you're committed to farming, you, you've got nothing nothing to lose here. But you can you can you can tap into the equity that that you have in you, in your your land, uh, but but thereby preserving it because you can no longer like, you're giving up the right for that land to ever be developed. And so when my parents bought this hmm. this farm that we were talking about in 1983. Uh, they did a concurrent sale of development rights to help finance the um, the purchase of of the farm, and so they because and that shows you how committed they were from day one. They're like, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna grow grapes. And we're gonna make wine, and so they already had that vision from the very beginning, and they were committed to it. And uh, and other farmers have followed suit um, and have done the same thing. And and there might be other reasons why a farmer doesn't want to sell their development rights. I mean, the land is worth more if you keep them intact. But that's so. That's one big thing, that the farmland, that especially the North Fork of Long Island, it's the last rural. Um, I just had someone at the winery the, the other day, and they're like, you know, you would never know that this is Long Island, right? Like if you're, you know, if if you're uh, from the city and you never really get out of the city that much, and you come out, you're like, where am I? Is this like upstate New York? Or is this actually Long Island? And because you're surrounded by fields, uh, you know, the vistas that you, you you wouldn't imagine existed only. 75 miles 70 75 miles 80 miles east of 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 manhattan and that's in that's in fact that's what you have and so that's really been special to be a part of and to see i was on the uh, farmland preservation committee in riverhead 
So I was involved, um, right, uh, to, you know, to, to a very sort of um, up close, uh, in, a, in an up close way for a while. Uh, but but the wine, the growth of the wine industry is also, you know, I, I don't know if, if if people remember Falcon Crest. There was that oh, show. I do. <laughs> There's a new Falcon Crest. It's called. Uh, I just watched it last night. Promised Land. Uh -huh. It's okay. Latinx. Uh, it's a Latinx uh, Falcon Crest. I, I have to check that out. Yeah. But I bring it up because I always joke that this is Falcon Crest you East. Look, East. He looks like Lorenzo Lamas. You're, you're a handsome dude. Man. <laughs> I love that. It's Falcon Crest East. Yes. Um, I mean, every every week, every month, every year is a new chapter, a new soap opera. There's different developments. Uh, there are different characters, you know, that have come and gone through our industry. Yeah. I can but imagine. but the but the um um the um the constant, I think. Really Really, uh, truly, has been this sort of um, uh, frontier type of attitude, right? Where, where you're on the frontier of something like you know, this hadn't been done before on Long Island, and, and a commitment to quality. And so we've been very, you know, at, at Pomonok, my parents were quality quality oriented from day one. A lot of producers on Long Island remain quality oriented, and uh, um, and I think we've accomplished a lot. I think the wines speak for themselves, and there's a lot of uh, you know, outstanding examples of of of, uh, of wines coming from Long Island, but just like any other wine region, you're also going to find, you know, are you going to find wines that are overpriced? Yeah. Are you going to find wines that are sort of overhyped and they're 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 not not what they're advertised to be? Of course. Mm -hmm. But you're also going to find gems. You're going to find values, just like any other wine region. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, and we talked about in your bio that you were on the Riverhead Farm Preservation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bureau board. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think that the work they do? I, I think. What you, here's my thought. I think that you need to preserve the farmland to make the North Fork still the North Fork. So you can't overdevelop it. Like I think mm -hmm. it would lose its appeal um, if you couldn't, you know, go out there and see vineyards and fields and have farmers markets. Is now was that like was that like a buy kind of like by design with these people or I mean how to or just or just that that's exactly what it's all about um, in fact the uh, godfather so to speak of the whole pro program just passed away uh, recently um, uh, uh, Mr. Talmadge I believe it's John Talmadge who uh, was involved back in the 70s mm -hmm. with getting this program going but 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 they saw the writing on the wall mm -hmm. that that uh, the East End, the Hamptons, and the North Fork were going to become you know uh, developed yeah. the, the same way Western Long Island uh, had been already, and so he was very crafty and creative in coming up with like how how do we figure this out, and and this is really a brilliant uh, mechanism because like I said uh, the uh, it, the system wouldn't work unless they the farmer got paid fair market value. And that's exactly what happens. The, the the farmers made an offer by the municipality. It could be the town or the county, or sometimes there are joint deals, whatever. Sometimes the state is involved. But bottom line, the uh, the farmer gets to cash out but keep their farmland. And so it's really a brilliant system. And 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 uh, the um, the um, the population, the, the 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 everyone who lives in the area. There's a vested interest because people have this, uh, as, as you point out, MJ. Like people, are like they want to preserve the rural character. I mean, yeah. it's it's a key it, part of our identity on on the East End, especially on the North Fork. It's like let's keep it this way. Mm -hmm. And so there was actually a referendum that was passed in 1999 to um, to create this two percent real estate transfer tax, um, which created something called the um, the the CPF, the Community Preservation Fund, and so two percent of every real estate transaction uh, over a certain th amount, like two hundred fifty thousand, begins to go into uh, an account that's used purely for for farmland preservation purposes. It's been it's been hi highly effective. Very cool. Very cool. <coughs> so <coughs> we we've had two Shannons. One is uh, the minimalist, and you have a minimalist family. And I, we kind of touched this a little bit when I was when, we, when I said natural wine. Mm -hmm. But what what is the what does the minimalist approach mean to you? Uh, so believe, we we it's it's funny we went through a whole naming process for this wine, and uh, one of my first thoughts was minimalist, but I wasn't crazy about it. We went through a whole process, and in the end, <laughs> I went with it because 
<laughs> because my father had used pretty straightforward names too. Like assemblage is what it is. It's yep. a blend. Late yep. harvest, it says it right there. That's what it is. Right. Barrel fermented is barrel fermented and minimalist is minimalist. That's what it is. And so so that begs the question, well, how is that different than than this? Like our regular Shannon, which, you know, well, that this wine, we'll, we'll, I, we, we, we will inoculate. We still inoculate a few uh, wines like this. The minimalist wines, I don't, I don't add anything at all, okay. uh, other than a, a, a little bit of sulfites, and uh, we've actually made a couple of minimalist red wines where I don't even add sulfites. Mm. Um, and again, it's not, you know, going down this sort of uh, the, the going into a just if you get into the this, that 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 sphere of of the wine industry where people <laughs> do things like that, mm. is like why why like why do you not add sulfites? Um, it, I'm not trying to prove anything. I just don't think the wine needs it. The, the sulfites are a preservative. That wine is loaded with its own preservatives because the way it was made, it had extended maceration. And on top of it, uh, the aging, it spent half of its time in steel. Uh, it was only a few months. And then it was bottled with the screw cap, all of which, you know, there's there's no need for sulfites. It's just a technical thing. And sure enough, I'm I'm really proud and pleased that you can crack that bottle open and it's fresh. I mean, is it going to last as long once it's open? No. But, you know, when you open a bottle, you drink it. That's pretty much my philosophy. <laughs> um, and I've said this before. I'll say it again. When people talk about natural wine, I remember being in the seventh grade, and we had to go over the periodic table of elements, and sulfur is on there. Sulfur is a naturally occurring compound yeah. in this world. Yeah. Um, now, I think, and what do you think? Do you think this whole... Pushback on sulfites comes from like supermarket wine that's really cheap and 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 they load it with sulfites and it's got all type of different chemicals in it. I, I mean, I don't drink that. It's 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 a great you know it's a great uh, conversation. I because we see we we hear we hear that all the time at the winery. Oh, I have, I have a, a, an issue with sulfites. I'm right. like, well, do you really? I mean, right. some people do, right. but and 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 one of the punchlines is like if you're really worried about what's in the wine you should be worried about the alcohol that that's what will kill well, you that's what i tell people <laughs> you get you know alcohol is a toxin right like, <laughs> the alcohol is the thing to be worried right, about exactly. um, i mean seriously if someone has a sulf a, a, a genuine sulfite allergy they know who they are they know they shouldn't be drinking alcohol they yeah. shouldn't be eating dried fruits they right. shouldn't be eating cured meats and all right. these other things they shouldn't be going to a salad bar at the airport where they spraying people think it's just water it's it's water and sulfites yeah. you know often yeah and uh so I, it's it's interesting how these uh the the um perceptions are formed it's uh, but sulfites are really um it's I, I like to make the analogy with aspirin i mean aspirin is kind of like a wonder drug like in many ways like your cardiologist if you have a heart problem I tell you take take a baby aspirin and that's where the analogy holds it's it's about dosage right you can eat a jar of Minimum aspirin. Minimum effective dose. Yeah, yeah, if you eat a jar of aspirin, you're you're going to kill yourself. Yeah. You can also kill yourself with sulfites. Right. But but if you use it judiciously, and you're like, why am I adding different levels in one wine and versus another? Like you know, it, it, you use it ju judiciously. But it's a great tool to to have at your disposal if you're a winemaker. Yeah. So um, cruising through the 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 OOS. <laughs> the 2010s. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of uh, led to the decision to purchase Palmer? Um, so, again, <laughs> I'm going to reference my father again. Um, we, the family was growing. We have more mouths to feed. You know, you, you look at, like, how do we grow? How do we move <laughs> forward? And uh, we could have, and, and we are, to a certain degree, growing organically at Pamanak, organically meaning, like, going to the next logical step mm -hmm. um th but um it, it, we also looked at at you know a, acquiring a, a neighboring winery and that's ultimately what we did and uh palmer is very close to pamanak geographically it's 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 about two miles as the crow flies it's very close and it's like a five minute drive so the logistics were very interesting but let's begin with the quality i mean from the earliest days bob palmer had a shared sort of vision and commitment to producing quality wine. And we're very lucky to have inherited all kinds of inventory at Palmer that's really uh, exciting. I tasted the 95 Cabernet Sauvignon not that long ago. Still, you know, um, still alive, still showing well. 
and uh, that blows me away. Uh, 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 Aged wine from Long Island. Yeah, it, it yeah. really is you, you, fucking up my head. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not? Why, no, why, I know. Why? I mean, so, it could be anywhere, but yeah. it's, just, it's just like you know, like it 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 it, it shouldn't be any different. I mean, uh, as long as the same parameters are met and so <laughs> forth. You know, keep your keep your yields down. Harvest when the fruit is at its zenith of ripeness and so forth. I mean, we you know we follow the same sort of parameters that you would uh, expect to see in, in elsewhere in the world where, where you see fine wine. Uh, but um, uh, but coming back to Palmer, I mean, it, it, the, it had been on the market for a while and we weren't really like dialing into it, but then we sort of uh, heard about another transaction that the family did and we're like, you know, maybe they'll be willing to, to, to negotiate. And so we were able to strike a deal that, that worked for us. And, uh, See that Wharton education came in handy. <laughs> Finally, Dad's like paid off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, there there is some of that in there. The, looking at potential synergies, and yeah. uh, because we do bottle everything at Pamanok, and for me as a winemaker, like right away, I'm like, okay, how are we gonna like do this? Because I'm I'm doing the winemaking for both, and so we 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 do all the fruit reception and and all the juice work and vinification at Palmer. For the Palmer wines, but then they get transported to Pamanok in bulk, and then the 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 final filtration and bottling happen at Pamanok, and then it goes back to Palmer as finished product. See, did you just slide him. He's the winemaker. I was wondering. <laughs> who, I was going to ask that. I mean, but I mean, objectively, I mean, two miles. I mean, there's. I know. I got friends in California. They get fruit in Mendocino, and they fucking truck it down to fucking Santa yeah. Barbara. Like, there's, there's people uh, uh, have to travel some fruit, so two miles is... It's, <laughs> right, exactly. It's, very fortunate. Yeah, and on the East End, if you're, you know, if anyone's familiar with, like, Hamptons traffic or North Fork traffic, uh, by the way, it's the Hamptons traffic in September and October is like Hamptons traffic, if, if, if people have only been to the Hamptons, for example. You can't move. It's like it's like is a, like a, it's like a standstill. <laughs> it's like, it's just, yeah, and so bad. most of the wineries on the North Fork are east of us. And so uh, just the logistics of, of um, and the practical aspects of uh, trying to make wine during the vintage would have been way more complicated if, if I had to go further east. And whereas was Palmer is just a couple minutes north and it's just uh, it works. So um, when did you take over winemaking duties? Um, so this is something that I'm not sure to what degree my father fully appreciates it, but I, I've been making the wine hands-on for now quite a bit longer than, than he did. I started in 01. Okay. I mean, you know, I've always worked with my father. I learned from my father more than anyone else. Uh, but in terms of the day-to-day hands-on winemaking, I've been doing it since, since 01. And this is like... At Pamanok and uh, 2018 at n- Palmer. No formal training. Like you said, your dad is, yeah. was making wine because he's in the Middle East and he... Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get alcohol. Yeah. Did you guys take any like you know, uh, you know, adjunct classes? Did you, did you audit any classes or something? Sure, like? exactly. <laughs> um, my father, my, I mean, my father is a very uh, uh, intelligent man, and he he is largely self taught, but he definitely had consultants uh, along the way. Um, actually, at the very beginning, he he had hired a, a full time winemaker. And uh, it ended up not working out with him in part because my father's like, I can do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, and uh, and so he did have a consultant sort of showing him the ropes. And um, uh, but, you know, my, my, my father uh, read a lot and uh, did what, you know, a lot of people in this industry do or what many farmers do. And, and farmers are by, by nature very resilient and resourceful. And that definitely des- describes my father as well. Very cool. What's it like working with your family? Because I <clears throat> have worked for family businesses and uh, not not actually a wine, but a different family yeah. businesses. And mm-hmm. like it, sometimes when when you're not in family, you're like a referee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, ultimately it's a blessing because you're working with your family. Um, but I also hear people say, "Oh, I can never work with my family." Like we would drive each other crazy. I'm like, "Well, yeah, that's that that still <laughs> that still happens." Um, and uh, so. Um, like so who's yeah. involved on the day to day your father yeah. obviously yeah your brother I, I have two brothers two bro- okay. Salim and Nabil Nabil is our vineyard manager okay and Salim is our admin manager my parents are still involved but they're beginning to to they're semi-retired let's say and um, and then the three of us my brothers and I all have children uh, and so the oldest grand 
child is Alexander, who's uh, turning 13 in uh, in May, and he's six feet tall. Wow. Yeah, he's 12 years old, and he's six feet tall. He's uh, playing basketball. <laughs> he is. He is. Yeah, he is yeah. playing basketball. Shit. And uh, so uh, we all have the the third generation is growing up, and that's part part of uh, coming back to Palmer earlier. That's part part of the reason. It's like so we have a larger critical mass. Mm -hmm. Not to force. I mean, at least speaking for myself, I'm not planning to force my kids into it but similar to the way my parents handle me if the door will be open you know if if they want to get into it um and if they don't you know that, that's fine too uh, but the family business i mean you know it's um it's special and it's not easy and as my father says if it drives you to drink at least you have enough of your own product there you go <laughs> <laughs> um but it, it's it's uh it's very special to be able to um First of all, most most of us live on the property. My wife and I live um, a few miles away, but the rest of the family lives on the property, mm -hmm. on or adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to ha to be you know for my parents to be surrounded by their children and their grandchildren like all the time. Well, my parents are in Florida half the year, but aside from <laughs> that, aside from that, uh, it's it's very it's it's special. And and you you know we we know these stories in wine about multi generational yep. fine wine yep. estates around the globe, and that is exactly our aspiration to be a multi-generational fine wine estate and so uh, my parents are the founders my brothers and i are the second generation the third generation is growing up i really do hope that you know i live that long where there's another generation uh that uh and and there's a subsequent subsequent sort of um handover you know that that we continue like that into the into the future yeah you know I did read in an interview where you you talked about um, what makes wine special. It's actually the story and the people behind the wine. It's you know, and um, and in that you talked about generational you know generational uh, uh, families who make wine. Um, you know, and actually I'll read the quote. It says it's about the story of people behind the wine. When I'm bottling, I hope my grandchildren one day will open this bottle and say. My grandfather made this wine. And this is one of the best vintages that he got to work on. Having a bottle like that and having a generation or two later being able to open that, there's something about that that's priceless. Um, talk about, you said it was aspirational, um, but you actually said, like, why, why, you know, like, why is that so important? I mean, you guys were tracking pretty well. It was great, yeah. IBM, <laughs> you know, UPenn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wh why is this so why is this so driving for you? Yeah, there's something that um, is very, um, I, I don't know if primal is the right word, but there's this, this, this the getting back to your roots type, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, I mean, you're, you're working with the land as, as, a, as a vintner. And, uh, you know, other farm, in, in the world of agriculture, vintners are sort of looked at as the prima donnas yeah. uh, because for whatever reason we're, we're, we're people we're, don't it's you're a fucking <laughs> farmer man people don't like but we're we I know. are farmers right like because like, um, it's want because wine costs more than broccoli and if anything the the, the it's extremely labor intensive yeah. it, it's it, i don't want to say it's harder or easier and so forth but you know it's it's farming but there's this special connection with with the land and the notion um that you're doing something that uh whether it's our own relatives or not i mean that 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 mankind has done for millennia i mean and and some and 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 you know we know that wine is just so special the special liquid that we imbibe that makes us feel good that is so complex even today we don't fully understand everything that's that's in there the connections to human longevity and you know, we could talk about resveratrol and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's well. Let's, just, let's just do that. Let's let's yeah, get some yeah. resveratrol. What we got in the red wine? Actually, let's, let's, I I, what I didn't a great segue. I, I didn't actually mean to do that, but uh, believe it or not, our wines are especially high in resveratrol. It's a true story. I can tell you about it. So, what do you uh, think? Should we try the assembly uh, or do you If want... you're going to do more than one, I would start with the Cabernet Franc. All right. I think we're going to probably. Well, you want to pick one? Yeah, let's pick one. Well, then do the Petit, petit Verdot. Okay. Because you right. mentioned that before, okay. and you really got to taste right. that. I got to taste it. Yeah. But the, so oh, it's a 2013. He came, yeah. <laughs> he came with some library selection. And that's, it's, I, I, it's, it's going to show young, I'm sure. Um, um, I noticed that you guys use, um, use uh, 
you said it. You use uh, the screw, caps. Screw, screw caps. Yeah. yeah. Why is that? Is that a conscious choice? Uh, cork taint. Uh, short answer is yes, and yeah. that's that's important because I can give a very Damn. long answer. Give a long answer. <laughs> you have, you have to edit so of of course, eliminating cork taint. Um, no, it's fine. Yeah, no, I was away from. <laughs> now we got to edit. That's for you, Jason. That's <laughs> um, okay. Um, of course, eliminating taint from the wine is like, uh, you know, it's actually we shouldn't be like that dismissive of it. It's a huge accomplishment. Like it wasn't that long ago, and even still today, we we encounter corked wines. Oh, and, I've and, had a f I had a run. I had a run lately. I hate it. And I, I love to quote Run DMC, not bad meaning bad, but bad meaning good. Yeah. When you have a really badly corked wine, it's great because we can agree that it's bad. Yep. But when it's just... I hate when, I hate when it's just a whiff. Exa that's the worst. My wife has gotten better. Like, I used to be good at that. But my wife's more sinned, and she's not, not even into wine. But I'm like, because I'm like, I'm like, is it corked? Yeah. And it, then she'll be like, this is bad. I'm like, fuck. Imagine being a winemaker. Yeah. Like... I, I'm I'm put on the spot like that, right. and I'm like I made the wine. How right. can how can I not right. be sure? It's so bothersome. It's so irksome, and and the feeling that the 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 confidence that I have now, I, I, I'll use that word again. It's it's priceless. Like I I can sleep at night, and the peace of mind that you enjoy now is 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 priceless. I mean now there are things like DM, there are alternate closures that are also clean, and and that's great. And even the the plain old natural cork suppliers are. You know, yep. cleaning up their act to a certain degree, but but uh, TCA is just so insidious and, and 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 bad news. Like, if you can categorically eliminate it, why wouldn't you? I mean, I mean, uh, there, obviously there's good reasons why, but they're mostly consumer psychology, marketing related. They're not technical. Right. Right. I mean, fucking box wine is actually the the best yeah. way to store yeah. wine because the, the Mylar bag it takes all the air out. Like, but like. Yeah. It, it's lightweight. Like, I mean, yeah. bo bag in a box it, packaging has a lot of legitimate. It. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but you know, except it doesn't age well. Yes. That, who that's who ages it? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Again, like, I'm gonna lay this box down. <laughs> um, I am uh, blown away. This got a really strong nose. I'm trying. It's really. Explode. This. I mean, it's under a screw cap. Highly recommend decanting it, which I plead guilty. I don't do enough of that. Yeah. But like, um, you know, the, and, amazing color. Mm -hmm. oh, good lord. Yeah, Hundred percent Petit Verdot. Wow. So again, when we first planted it, we had no intention of making a varietal Petit Verdot. But that first vintage where it really shined in '05, like we were tasting it out of barrel, and we even had a couple customers who were like, you know, uh, if you bottle this separately, like we'll we'll buy it, we'll take a case. Yeah. And we said, you know what, we should do that. And so in our best vintages, we produce these single vineyard labels. We call this Apollo Drive Vineyard. That's that's the road that it's off of. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I, I love this wine because it's really a little, it's more distinct in character than like the Merlot and the Cab. And people who don't know, I'm like, well, do you like Northern Italian reds? If you do, you might be into this. It shares a similar profile, high alcohol, lots of tan and lots of acid and great color. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know. There's a very floral note to this one. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. just trying to figure out what it is, but I can't. Um, and, and it's got some spice. <clears throat> There's often like the black pepper thing going yeah, on that's, here. Yeah, yeah, Somet like, sometimes that's... sumac a little bit. Um uh, we like to call this black and blue, like blackberry. Uh, yeah, black blackberry. and blue fruits, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if I tasted this blind, I might not know it was Petit Verdot, but I definitely mm -hmm. would, I wouldn't yeah. be like, that's from Long Island, mm -hmm. yeah. which is great because it is. It, it's actually showing the place it's from. But like, yeah, I just... I want to say I need to drink more wine, but I don't need to <laughs> actually drink more wine per se. But I need I need to. Uh, this is a good this is a good episode. I'm tasting some stuff I wouldn't normally taste. Right on. I definitely good, don't need good, to drink good. any good. more wine. Really, <laughs> I, I'm pretty good. <laughs> um, but no, that's that's um, and that's nine years old. Here again, like yeah. busting uh, and, thing ideas i have in my head because i lived on long island for like a, a, a briefly for like a year or so you know nine months mm -hmm. i lived in sag harbor and you mm -hmm. know we'd go out to the you know to the palmer and you, know, you go to you go to and i'm like eh, the wines were really green but mm -hmm. now the vines have uh they're older 
Look, I mean, they they may still be green in some cases, depending on the producer, depending on the vintage. Yeah. Again, not unlike um, you know, pick another region. Yeah. Uh, but um, depends on the. the but there's also the been nature. a maturity of, of of the region. You have uh, winemakers and 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 grape growers who are now veterans of the industry who've really honed their craft and and know how to, uh, you know, handle our terroir and and produce great wine. So pop quiz across. Palmer and Pomanoc. Thank you. <laughs> My brain just it's just there's is just not gonna I'm not gonna say it right, so I'm gonna be respectful. Um it's all good. how many different uh wines or varietals do you guys like did you guys you have to have a rose. I we mean, do. You have to have a rose to be. Yeah. In wine so, in these days. in that sense, I'm a little bit masochistic. Like we do a lot. We <laughs> we, we make a lot of wines at Pomanoc. We make a lot of the wines at Palmer. Mm -hmm. Doing magnums, kegs. We, do, we I played around with cans last year. We we also do some bubbly. Mm -hmm. uh, the bubbly is the only wine that we uh, outsource. At least the traditional method work. Uh, it's our fruit. We make the base wine at Pomanoc, and then we bring it over to Lens Winery, mm -hmm. and they do the traditional method. Uh, all all that work. And so it's nice to outsource one wine, but um, uh, we we do make a lot of wine. We also make a Sauvignon Blanc. We make dry Riesling, semi dry Riesling. Sometimes the late harvest, uh, the rosé. Uh, what do you use for the rosé? My preference is Cab Franc. Okay. Uh, but usually it doesn't all. You know, the nice thing about rosé blowing up the way it's blown up the last decade or so is uh, the. Um, it allows us to strengthen our red wine program. Right. So if a wine, if a crop, if a crop is not, if you're forcing it into a red wine and it doesn't want to be that, it's perfect for rosé. Mm. And so that's a great tool for us on Long Island that that the rosé market is so healthy. And and I've done that. Uh, whereas the, within the last ten years, whereas the last ten years before that, it was less of an option. Let's say. And uh, but I mean rosé on Long Island. Look, it's it's there's no question. It's a winner. I mean. Uh, we'll look at Wolfer. Wolfer's had huge success, and and others too. Summer in a bottle. Yep. Channing Daughters and others. Yep. And uh, um, and we're, our rosé has done well for us too, at both Pomanoc and Palmer. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what's kind of in your sights uh, when you look ahead for the future of your of the of the wine? Uh, actually, we'll do two things. Future on Long Island first. What do you see as someone who's been out there now who's a veteran 20 years or so? Um, I, w I think we're going to see, uh, to a certain degree, more of the same, meaning the same sort of uh, uh, pursuit and commitment uh, to, to quality. Mm -hmm. And, like, how do we continue to hone our craft? How do we continue? You know, I, I, I mentioned how we had this really difficult period where we had to rip out some vineyards due to leaf roll but you know in any tragedy which it essentially was uh there's a silver lining and the silver lining there is like okay we've been doing this for 30 years 40 years we now have a much better sense of what rootstock we should be using what clones we want to get in there and so you get the right dna in there and you the point is you have an opportunity to 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 do a dna upgrade and 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 uh, and, and start over um and so there's some of that going on uh, throughout the industry where, and you have, uh, there's new blood that's come in, there's new ownership that's come in. Um, and uh, the majority of what's, you know, uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening. And uh, there's also this sort of, um, I think the North Fork of Long Island and, you know, the whole East End wine scene is somewhat emblematic of what's just what's happening in this country. And what, what, if you look at it, Americans are becoming more European in their appreciation of, of gastronomy and wine. Uh, the irony is that in Europe, it's kind of the opposite's happening, <laughs> <laughs> even though per capita consumption, I think, still remains higher in Europe. But, but like, uh, on Long Island, uh, as with most wine regions, there, there's this great symbiosis between the local food scene and the, the, the other, the, and uh, there's agriculture and aquaculture. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of oysters being grown by oyster farmers and, and all kinds of other crops being raised, and and now livestock too, and there's just just this uh, this culinary scene that's developing, and it, obviously that's the the most beautiful match when you when you, when we compare our wines with the local cuisine, 
And I think you're going to see a lot more of that type of, and in fact, uh, at Long Island Wine Country, our organization that represents most of the wineries, that's exactly what we're, we're working on a campaign to do just that, to celebrate the bounty of what we have on the East End from the land, from the sea, uh, with our wines and, and, and celebrate that. How did you get involved with Long Island Wine Country? I mean, besides you make wine on Long Island. Um, <laughs> the organization? Yeah, the organization. Uh, yeah. So um, it, it was formerly Long Island Wine Council. We changed the council to country to sort of reflect a, a change uh, that, that we kind of went through as an organization a couple of years ago. So for a long time, uh, my family and I were, I mean, w w the uh, Pamanok w was not a member. And, okay. and there's a whole backstory. My father was president of Long Island Wine Council for most of the 1990s. And um, there was, a, let's say, a philosophical difference where he left. And, uh, and we remained out of it for quite some time. The organization was sort of, sort of beginning to fall apart at one point. And, and we agreed as a, members and non-members alike that agreed it wasn't healthy. And like, look, we need, to get, we need to figure this out. So we went through a strategic planning process. And at the end of it, we went through an election process, and I ended up uh, becoming president of the interim board. And, and since then, I've been president of the organization for the last couple of years, which, of course, have been COVID. <laughs> yeah. So uh, COVID, uh, you know, um, threw a wrench in everybody's lives, including ours. Um, but uh, we're fortunate that the, the, it didn't wreak havoc uh, in our lives as much as, uh, you know, what you I mean, you know, everyone has their own connection and story with COVID, but for for our industry, at least for our organization, it did definitely uh, throw a wrench into the works. But uh, hopefully, that's all winding down now. So, since you brought up <clears throat> Mr. Nineteen, um, how did that affect your business? Are you, were you are you on premise, off premise, DTC? How did how how did that affect your business with your wine? How are your wines sold? Where are they primarily placed? So before COVID, we were at Pamanok anyway. We were roughly fifty-fifty retail wholesale. Okay. Uh, we, we 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 actually I spent a lot of my uh, time at Pamanok doing uh, uh, selling our wines, repping our wines here in in, in Manhattan and sure. Brooklyn for many years. And um, uh, and so point is, we we had a pretty healthy uh, distribution in the city. And of course, when COVID happened, I mean that just totally blew up. I mean, blew up in a bad way it just evaporated mm -hmm. um, all that business we had several restaurants pouring our wines by the glass and you know for a wine producer a by the glass placement it's almost like an annuity if you have a strong yep. by the glass placement you know that wine you're moving inventory generating cash flow it's it's a wonderful thing and that all just went away it disappeared so very quickly we realized we were being handed lemons and we had to make lemonade and so i said well let's see let's give this how about if we give the same price to our retail customers on a case and so the point is we came up with a flash sale where we offered a big discount. It had to be a full case. Mm -hmm. And so we kept people safe, our customers safe, mm -hmm. our employees safe by either shipping the wine or doing curbside pickup. And so that was so effective, we're, st we're still doing it. We're still offering flash sales every now and then. And, uh, but, and so with COVID, uh, the percentage shift in favor of retail. Okay. And once, once the lockdown ended and we opened up again, 2020, we'll never forget forget it because of coronavirus. But the point is, uh, since we were um, limited to outdoor seating only for a while, it worked because it was so dry. Yeah. And so that reflects on the 2020 vintage. It was a, a hot, dry season. It was a strong vintage overall. And um, But uh, it's one of these crazy counterintuitive things where business has essentially never been better at the winery, mm. our retail business. Mm -hmm. uh, due to the, seemingly due to the pandemic yeah yeah so <clears throat> now let's go back to what what are you you know excited about and see in the future at your family's vineyards i think um one of the things that we uh, that needs to sink in for my family and I is that the third generation is not going to stop growing. Mm. There's going to come a point in time where they're, uh, and it's happening very quickly, very imminently with with my my nephew, getting to an age where he like, look, I might I might want to do this, and so we need to be we need to think about that and think that through. 
And then we need to think carefully about um, climate change uh, confronts oh, us yeah. all, yeah. confronts any vintner, any in the world. You, you know, there's no place that's a safe haven from climate change. And so um, there are different ways we can adapt and, and confront the reality of climate change, uh, many different ways. Uh, technology is one. We're, we're, we're investing in a couple. We're hoping to take delivery on two electric tractors this spring. Oh, wow. And these tractors are supposedly going to be autonomous, or at some point they might become autonomous. And the holy grail, or I mean, or something that would be really revolutionary, would be for this tractor to drive itself at night, pulling a UV light machine and bathing the vines in UV light. The UV light will kill the powdery mildew. And right there, you can cross off a key pesticide that is no longer needed. I mean, that's that's the hope. We'll see if it comes to pass. But if, if, if something like that were to happen on Long Island, we have a particularly high um, pressure for powdery mildew because of the humidity, yeah. the perennial humidity that we see. And the warm nights, I mean, it wasn't always the one of the, the most disturbing things with climate change for us is the average lows are getting higher mm. the nighttime lows are like higher and higher and that 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 makes it like a permanent like infection period for powdery but if you had this thing bathing your vines in uv light like all of a sudden like it's you turn the tables on it um i mean i'm i'm being hopeful and <laughs> I, I think by nature i'm an optimist and that's what I'm, but like let's say that's okay that didn't really happen okay now what i mean so i've, I've been thinking we haven't done it yet but i've already sort of been mentally like uh, preparing myself to, you know, you, you need to be prepared to think different, to think outside the box, and we might plant natives or, or hy uh, hybrids or natives, because Long Island is 99% vinifera. Okay. And so, but I wouldn't rule out, uh, let's put it this way, from a sustainability standpoint, it's impossible to ignore uh, the possibility of planting uh, hybrids and natives, and so, um, I try to keep force force myself to be open minded. Yeah, I know um, it might be somewhat controversial. Some people are like, oh, like you know, how can you even say that? Whatever. But you, you, like I said, it's impossible to ignore the sustainability aspect of of growing those uh, those type of grapes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we're gonna wrap up here soon, but I want to go back to some how you. Uh, you said your father was a Francophile, mother's from Germany, so you have that European influence. Yeah. Um, food and wine, a big part of growing up as a child. Yeah. Um, you know, in my family, there was no, like, oh, you can't drink alcohol. It was just... Uh, That's how they do it, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Just, it just happened one day. Just like give you a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. give you a little bit. Right. And my mother, my mother is truly like the second coming of Julia Child. She's she's amazing. She's a fa fantastic cook, um, and she you know she can cook German, she can cook Lebanese, she can cook French. Uh, um, very talented. I, I mean, my brothers and I uh, were very spoiled in that regard. My mother would just take care of us, and uh, and to this day, we'll still make. Uh, amazing um meals for us at home and so and wine you know we always had my parents always had wine at the table before we started producing our own yeah like i said uh, bordeaux and burgundy and germany uh the faults in particular uh were at the table um and you know uh we're mindful as producers not about cellar palate you don't you don't want to just drink your own wine. You, Don't get you, high on your own <laughs> supply, right? <laughs> Gotta see what else is out there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so it's it's important to to do that, you know. And so as much as possible, we try to drink uh, the world, you know, try to expose ourselves to what's out there. So was there a bottle when you're growing up or at some point in your 20s when you're working on Wall Street and you went out and you had this expensive – was there a bottle where you're like, oh, my God, I just love wine. Is there a wine that it just – did that for you in your in your life, your career? You know, I, it, it, and earlier you asked me like about favorite this and favorite that. I'm yeah. I'm not the type of person where like I do that, but but I do have an answer for you. <laughs> um, there, there was I think it was um, I believe it was the '97 Ridge Litton Springs Ooh. Zen, uh, where I was like, all right, this is like 
this is a beautiful wine. Like I like I could understand why people like are like going out of their way to get this wine. Yeah. Uh and, and I've been a fan of Ridge ever since. Um and and you know, there are so many other great wines out there. Um but that but that was like one in particular where like I sort of had like a bit of an epiphany. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Well Kareem man, thank you so much for uh coming way from the east in a Long Island of the city to do this. Um I uh, really appreciate your time and your generosity and the story and the wines. Um, tell everybody uh, about how they can find you, how they can be a part of what you're doing at Pamanok Vineyards. There you go. Well, thank you so much, MJ. I'm so happy to have been here with you. I mean, we have our website, pamanok.com. We're on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, those are probably the best ways. Um, but, you know, if you're a New Yorker, it's so easy to come and visit us. Uh, if you're driving, you take the mid, go out the Midtown Tunnel and don't turn. Just go straight. <laughs> I swear to God, yeah. just drive straight <laughs> till the highway ends, and then you keep going straight for six miles, and you're there. I love it. I love it. Well, um, for all you guys listening, don't forget to check out the show notes for each episode. That's where you're going to find the information on the wines we drank. We'll have the website. We'll have the social media handles for. Pomenock Vineyards. Pomenock Vineyards. <laughs> we'll throw Palmer in there, too. I can say Palmer. <laughs> oh, Kareem, thanks again. Until the next time, cheers to the Mavericks, philosophers, deep thinkers, and all you wine drinkers out there. Peace.